Greetings to the brightest audience in West LA. My name is Bob Enyar. I'm the host of Real Science Radio in Denver, Colorado, the most powerful radio station in the state out of Denver, airs a creation science program every Friday for 20 years now. And this morning in California, in Malibu, I had the honor of being in the audience to hear Dr. C.K. Tong speak on the faith of our fathers and the ancient Chinese pictographs. So Dr. Tong, what an honor to meet you in person today. Nice to meet you, Bob. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to pick your brain if I could. You mentioned that the language is the, the monument of a culture. And so the ancient pictographs are an ancient Chinese monument. Could you explain that? Um, the Chinese uh, written form is the only surviving iconic uh, written language in the world. Uh, many ancient uh, written languages were iconic. In other words, uh, they used pictures to represent tangible and intangible uh, terms. Uh, but they have all evolved into phonetic system like English. Now, why do they do that? It's because it's easier for people to learn that language when it's phonetic. Uh, you can use alphabets to, to uh, help you remember how to write. Uh, the difficulty of uh, iconic language such as Chinese, like all Chinese uh, language students will complain, is that you have to memorize hundreds and thousands of symbols. Oh, yeah. Now, yes, that is an, a disadvantage, but the advantage of an iconic language is that the meaning that, are em that is embedded in the, the icons do not need to change. So, in other words, a phonetic language like English, our letters of our alphabet, 26 letters, we have little keyboards we only need for 26 characters. And the characters represent the sounds that we make our words out of. Mm -hmm. But in a pictographic language, you actually could put a picture representation of whatever the word is. If it's a tree, the word for tree could look sort of like a tree. Yes. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that the Chinese pictographs uh, from, we know that today they're modern, then there were classical, but then there were ancient pictographs. Mm -hmm. How do we know what the ancient ones looked like? Uh, there are uh, lots of artifacts. Uh, for example, uh, we have 55,000 uh, pieces of uh, oracle bones, uh, fragments, uh, that dig back to 3,000 years ago, and then we also have bronze uh, inscriptions that date back to the Shang Dynasty, to the Han Dynasty. About how far, how long ago were uh, those dynasties uh, about? Well, uh, the Shang Dynasty would be about 1,600 years before Christ. The Han Dynasty is up to about uh, 200 years after Christ, AD 200 or so. So that so, scribes or artisans would take bones treat the bones and then uh, inscribe on them inscribe and the same thing with bronze they would engrave on mm -hmm. bronze mm -hmm. so that we have many samples of ancient Chinese writing yes so you, you will see a revo uh, evolution of the words but the evolution is not dramatic it is more stylistic changes you know just like the different fonts you have in your computer you know, you can go from, uh, say, Roman, Times Roman to Arial. It's b basically the Helvetica, same. Yes. A little different. But, but with a phonetic language, um, you can change maybe in 50 years because phonetic languages got to change its spelling when people pronounce it differently. So you, you already see, like, uh, say, if you look at the King James Bible, most of the modern English speakers will not be able to read it. Right. They didn't have the letter J yes. in 1611, so Jesus never appears. It's Jesus. Yes. And so our letters change, and if we look back a thousand years ago, we have a hard time understanding because it's phonetic. Yes. But what if it's not phonetic? What if it's pictographic? Uh, if it's a pictograph, then even if 
the culture changes, maybe the picture still has a meaning. Yes. Well, uh, the, uh, the, my famous example is, say, the icons for ladies' room and men's room. Mm. Uh, now the symbols have been embedded. I think you can go anywhere around the world and you will be, and thankfully, will be able to find the men's room and the ladies' yeah, room. The, a now, picture of a woman in a skirt and, and a, a man, man in pants. Yes. And, okay, so you, 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 you imagine that, uh, say, the English word uh, for ladies and, or uh, men and women can change, right? Because uh, that is a phonetic system. Uh, but the icon, uh, themselves do not need to change. Mm -hmm. So a thousand years from now, uh, I would assume that those two icons will still be in use. If because the, Angeles, meaning, the meanings are embedded yeah. in the, in the uh, but, but, script. But let's say Los Angeles is under the water in the Pacific. An archaeologist, Marine, they go down and they find the men's room and the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. And they see the ladies' room symbol and they say, oh, they used to wear a, a dress, That's a skirt. Right. That's right. So we know, even a thousand years later, we could see, we could perceive. Well, that's why I say that they are monuments of a culture, because, uh, because of this embedded meaning. Uh, it's amazing that we can get into the minds of the ancient Chinese uh, through that, because what they knew or the ideas they have are embedded in the words. We, we can sort of through those windows. It's just like when you click on your computer, you have many icons, and when you click on different one, a different window opens up for you. Mm. So in the same way, when you click on these Chinese icons, you are, in a sense, getting into a new vista. And that vista, I know that you wrote in Chinese, I can't read this, but I have the English copy, The Faith of Our Fathers, and what a beautiful book. And we have friends who go to China every year, so we're going to get them copies of your book to bring because what I learned from your talk is that many of the ancient Chinese pictographs, they demonstrate knowledge of the book of Genesis so that the ancient Chinese understood what God had revealed to man and the particulars of the Garden of Eden, the trees in the garden, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve and the serpent, temptation, sin, it's all there in the early, the ancient pictographs. The classical ones changed a little, and then the modern ones changed even more. But I thank the Lord we have the ancient pictographs so we could see. Could we talk about some of that? But uh, maybe even before that, you mentioned the border sacrifice, yeah. the most ancient Chinese religious ceremony. Mm -hmm. Could you describe that for us first? Yeah, well, that's uh, uh, correct, because uh, if I am just presenting Chinese characters, uh, providing us with an idea of the Genesis account, then it would be very weak, because, you know, it's any man's guess. But what I have discovered is that there are many lakes that support my conclusion and one of that is the ancient uh, border sacrifice. Uh, since the beginning of Chinese civilization, there was this uh, sacrifice. Uh, there was not a time in Chinese history that said, oh, we started the border sacrifice. The, the moment you see Chinese history or historical records, there was this border sacrifice. And it continued for a few millennia until 1911, uh, when the Chinese uh, dynastic system stopped through the revolution of uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen. But I actually have private information. This is not recorded, but I actually, in my research, discovered that, uh, well, first of all, uh, Yuan Shikai, the usurper of uh, the revolution, sacrificed in 1914. But I have private knowledge that uh, Chairman Mao also performed a sacrifice <laughs> when he took over China in 1949. But the, the point is that no Chinese dynasty ever failed to sacrifice at the border. Now, uh, what we have there are the ceremonies, and these are very well recorded, very well documented uh, ceremonies. Uh, every Chinese dynasty is very careful 
to keep records. They, they are uh, very committed to history and they have historical records, but for the border sacrifice, we have uh, a few sources. One is the Book of Rites, uh, in Chinese it's Li Ji, and it prescribes the ceremony, the animal use, and uh, every detail is very well described there. And then we have the, uh, what we call the uh, statutes of the Ming and the Qing dynasty, Da Min Hui Dian, Da Qin Hui Dian. These are uh, like your court documents. They, they document the event and they document the prayers and the songs that are sung. And when you, when you look at the songs, and you'll find that it describes a few amazing things. This is contrary to common knowledge of Chinese. First of all, it describes a creator God, one creator God, not a multitude. There's one creator God they call Shangdi, or at some other times, Tian. That is not a problem in itself because even in the Hebrew culture, they use different names for God. And sometimes sure. Elohim and sometimes Yahweh, you know, uh, Adonai. So the Chinese use uh, two main names, Shangdi uh, and Tian. All right. So in the, the border sacrifice of prayers and songs, it describes a creator God, a creator God who created everything. And then it talks about uh, this creator God having a personal interest in people. It says that this Shangdi loves the Chinese people. Shangdi ai zhong guo min. Okay, so, and it goes beyond. Uh, the emperor calls this Shangdi father. Wow. So the, it, it is a person. The emperor personal... is the most powerful man. Yes. Of maybe, probably the most powerful empire in the world. For a few yet, millennia. <laughs> yet there's instances where he humbles himself and refers to the one creator God as father. He calls him father, but he recognizes that he is a servant. Um, later tonight, when I talk about the border sacrifice, you'll find that six days before the border sacrifice, the emperor will issue an edict. But this edict is interesting. It is not for the humans. It's actually for the spiritual world. He is telling the spiritual world that he is about to worship to Shangdi and that they better join him. And when he issues that edict, he calls himself Zhen, which is a superlative I in Chinese language. Now, contrast that to the prayers he will make at the body sacrifice. He submits himself to Shangdi. He calls himself Chen, meaning servant. Mm. So you see the hierarchy. When he addresses the spirits, he calls himself the superlative I. When he addresses God, he calls himself a servant. servant. Not, not only that, he, he uh, expresses his unworthiness. He expresses his as small as like an ant. And in that, I also see that the ancient Chinese recognize that uh, humans are unworthy of God. We can call that a knowledge of sin. Mm. Dr. Tang, in the border sacrifice, there was, I don't know if it was a, a lyric of a song or a poem or a prayer, but it sounds like Genesis chapter 1. It begins, of old, in the beginning there was great chaos. That's just like Genesis mm -hmm. chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it goes on to say, without form and dark, the planets had not yet begun to revolve, mm -hmm. nor the two lights to shine. Mm -hmm. There's so many references to Genesis chapter 1 and then it says so before the lights began to shine uh, God you made heaven you made earth you made man all things became alive and able to reproduce mm -hmm. this is exactly from Genesis 1 mm -hmm. to reproduce after their kinds mm -hmm. so that is uh, from the oldest Chinese religious ceremony to have such a strong connection to the first chapter of the Hebrew Scriptures mm -hmm. and, of course, the Christian Bible, that's very significant. Yes. Now, the, the reason that most people, uh, including Chinese, are not aware of these uh, songs and these uh, prayers is because this uh, ceremony was privy only to the elite. The emperor would perform this sacrifice 
but it, it was only limited to his uh, ministers and his chief servants. All the ladies are excluded from the, the ceremony. So people ask me, uh, why do we not hear about it? I say, well, it's because it was not uh, open to the public. Uh, the temple of heaven was sacred, sacred ground. Now we can go there any time, but uh, it was not open to the public uh, before the communists took over. So, yeah, this is like a best kept secret. But now, in this generation, these are all available. Anybody who wants to examine those prayers, you can buy uh, or you can actually go online and, and, and visit those resources. But I, I want to go on here. Um, but important thing too is that there are other records that show us that the ancient Chinese uh, believe in uh, vicarious sacrifice, meaning that a person can die behalf of others. Again, this is very similar to Christian doctrine, mm. and it is recorded in Chinese history that goes back a few thousand years. Uh, there was a drought uh, during the reign of uh, Emperor Shangtang, uh, the first emperor of the Shang dynasty. Uh, again, this goes back to about 1600 years uh, before Christ. Wow. And so we're back about the time of Moses. That's correct. And, and there was a, maybe even to the time of Joseph, hmm. there was a seven-year drought. Oh, my. And uh, the Shang people did everything they could to appease uh, Shang Di, but it seemed like the drought went on forever. Just like in L.A., you have the drought for four years. Yeah. Um, they're against reservoirs in California. Yeah, I, I don't know, know why. But, uh, but anyway, so um, finally, uh, his advisors came to him and said, uh, Emperor Tang, we, we, we need to do something drastic. We need to offer a human sacrifice. Oh. Now, human sacrifices uh, happen in China. Usually when emperors died, they were bury uh, their concubines and, and other people with them. But it was never institutionalized. In other words, they do not offer human sacrifices to God. Uh, the way so, in the Old Testament, there were pagan nations that's right. that would offer to Molech that's right. a child. But China child. never, never, it is a not. A sin, a great wickedness. But um, so China, if the emperor died, but it wasn't part of their It's not a part of a worship to, to this uh, supreme being. It, it was not required. But anyway, um, the ministers decided maybe that's what they needed to uh, please God. Uh, because and Shang Tang was because a, of the drought. Because of the drought, because he was getting severe. So Shang Tang was known to be a good uh, emperor uh, in Chinese history. But to everyone's surprise, uh, Shang Tang said, "Yes, okay, let's do it," and set up a date and a place at the Mulberry Bush. So he. Uh, showed up, and to everyone's surprise, he actually uh, prepared himself. He cleaned himself, he shaved himself, he put on sackcloth, and he was to be the sacrifice. So he agreed to it, but he made himself wow. uh, the sacrifice. And it is recorded in the, the, the Louis uh, Con uh, Chronicles. He, he said a prayer. This prayer is recorded. The prayer... Uh, to this effect, he said, uh, I have seen, do not impute the sins on the people. If the people have seen, please just let, uh, let me die for them. So do not let my uh, sin cause the destruction of so many lives. That's a prayer he recorded. And then rain came and the Chinese nation huh. was saved. But the, the, Did he die? No, he didn't die because rain came and he didn't have to go through with the sacrifice. But the, the important thing here is that it shows us there is clearly an example, a very supreme example that the ancient Chinese, at least in that one in instance, knew that one person, especially the leader, can die on behalf of the sins of the people. Wow. Before we talk then about some of the vocabulary, the pictographs, I know you give a number of examples from Chinese history where they acknowledge the creator God. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're amazing. I didn't know that that was part of China's history. 
but there is behind us an image of a San Sing Ju. I don't know how to pronounce it. San Sing Tui. San Sing Tui. Mm -hmm. And this is a bronze, a bronze uh, statue that was very tall, right? Yep. Four meters tall. 3.95 meters. And uh, it took me a while studying it to see the elements in it. Mm -hmm. But could you describe to us uh, some of the elements? Well, well, let me say first that uh, I will describe some of the words and relate them to the Genesis account. Okay. And there will be objections from people who say, oh, you're just reading your Christian uh, perspective on the, the formation of these words. But with the border sacrifice records, with other Chinese historical records, with the, um, and now we, we have these artifacts. This is one of the most exciting uh, discovery of modern China. Uh, in fact, it has been said that this is one discovery that has rewritten Chinese history. Oh I won't go into that detail, but they discovered this civilization in a place called San Xin Tui, which is in the Sichuan province, about 25 uh, miles, no, sorry, 25 kilometers north of uh, Chengdu, which is the capital of Sichuan province. And they discovered many bronze objects. But the most exciting object is really this uh, life size tree. This is about. A, a life size tree? It's about. Like we have a tree uh, in my front yard. It's about 11 to 12 feet tall. So it's not. A super tall tree, but no. it can it is a, a sort of a medium size, uh, say cherry tree. Okay, so and I see branches and fruit on the tree. Yes. Okay. So this tree uh, bears incredible resemblance to the Genesis record because you will see here branches with fruit. But the interesting thing is that you will see that. The, the leaves and the, the branches are formed in such a way like knives that are protecting the fruit. So in a sense, you can say that this is like forbidden fruit. It's not welcoming. The fruits are attractive, but please, you know, don't think of it. Yes. And then the other thing that is interesting that it will be hard for the audience to see, but you can actually see here... There's a serpent. This is a snake. And was this the end? It looks like it's It looks like it's, it's the end. Yeah, it could be broken. But the important thing is, you see, there is a snake by this tree. And the other uh, interesting thing that it, it draws resemblance to the biblical account is that this snake has two front feet. The Bible says that before the, the, the fall, the snakes had feet. Right. Okay. But the other thing which is, again, not very clear is that there is a human hand. You see here, there is a human yes. hand yes. reaching out, touching the snake, but also reaching out to the tree. So what I am about to describe the Chinese words are not based simply on my own imagination uh, influenced by the Bible, but it is supported by concepts in Chinese historical records and also artifacts such as this uh, bronze tree from the San Xin Tui civilization. They, they estimated that this uh, bronze structure and other bronze structure to be about 2,700 to 4,700 years old. Oh, my. And, uh, so that means we're back to the time of the patriarchs or yeah. before yes. Abraham even. Yeah, so there's a lot of history to that, all right? Now, also remember that China had no interactions with the Hebrew culture at this time. In other words, they didn't read the Bible. It was, they were not influenced by the Hebrew scripture. It was their own independent knowledge of the Genesis record. So, now, if you believe the Bible and there was a dispersion yes. at the Tower of Babel, yes. I, I just believe that the Chinese, uh, the group that went to China, uh, carried with them knowledge of the Genesis record. Now, when God confused the language, he did not give the people amnesia. They, they only, remembered... They remembered, but the in a different language. From Noah yeah. and, Shem, and, 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 and Genesis, David. yeah. And that's the other thing, okay? Uh, because the patriots at that time lived many years. So, unlike us, most of us would be very blessed if we get to see our grandchildren, maybe our great-grandchildren, but very few of us 
Well, I don't think anybody gets to see our great-great-grandchildren. But in those days, I calculated that some of them uh, saw children up to the 11th generation. Wow. So what that means is that the oral tradition from Genesis were very much firsthand. Mm. And, and that got carried, and when they dispersed, uh, when they, they had to design these uh, iconic languages, of course, they would think of these very uh, famous stories told by their ancestors. So the descendants of Noah, perhaps through Ham, that went east, eventually to the land of the rising sun, because our east in Japan, it's the same thing. Yeah. The history of the world comes out of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. the whole, not out of Africa, but out of the Mesopotamian Valley. Mm -hmm. out of where the Bible lands. And so then they developed a language, a written alphabet, but not an alphabet, a pictograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Babylon, they had many gods. And one of the gods, they had the sea god and the sun god, with all their gods, the fish god. But they also had the alphabet god. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, peculiar to me, because if, if I were to invent a god, I wouldn't invent an alphabet guy. But it reminds us that the human race, we spoke a language, but we didn't have a written, we didn't have a written alphabet. Mm -hmm. So in Babylon, they created their alphabet, Ugaritic, whatever, mm -hmm. and they had a god to that. Those who went east to China and settled there, they began to develop their written form of their language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so could you tell us about some of those ancient pictographs? I remember one you mentioned today at Pepperdine was righteousness. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that? Righteousness uh, in Chinese is yi. It's actually a very complex word in the classical form. Uh, in the simplified form, it's uh, much easier. But let's talk about the classical form. The classical form has lamb with the tail cut off and me below. So this is an ideogram, all right? Ideogram means you take the concrete and then you put them together to give an abstract idea. Righteousness is not a concrete idea. Righteousness is an abstract idea. Yeah. So you have to find some uh, ways to let the people understand the, the word. So the ancient Chinese, for some reason, choose the lamb above me to mean, uh, to mean righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now, in the oracle bone inscription that I talked about, you see a lamb with a dagger piercing the lamb. So if you put the two and two together, you see, wow, both of uh, the two forms uh, carry a single meaning, that righteousness comes from a sacrifice. And to interpret the uh, classical form, I can say that righteousness is when I put the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, above me, and so that God sees me through the lamb. So that I am a living sacrifice because I submit my life to the lamb who is above me. Well, and the lamb above me gives me the righteousness. Uh, righteousness is not a character but rather a legal position, wow. right? We are made right with wow. God, not that we are of anything of ourselves, a wow. good person. Now, but Thank you for that the, explanation. But even the simplified form, uh, the simplified form has a cross light uh, figure, then with a dot in the middle. The cross is actually a chalice or a cup. And it is a special cup. It's a cup that is used in covenant, Okay, and then the dot represents blood. So in the simplified form, which was not an invention by Chairman Mao in the 60s, it was actually a variant form from ancient times. But when Chairman Mao simplified the script, uh, the experts chose this simpler form. And so the simpler form actually carries the same meaning, that righteousness comes as a result of a sacrifice. That's why you have the blood. Um, to extend this further, to, to support my view that this Chinese word, righteousness, yi, has a biblical or a, a meaning similar to the Bible. I would not say biblical meaning because, again, remember the ancient Chinese had, no, uh, had not read the Bible. So they were not informed by the Bible. 
but they carried the same knowledge from Genesis. Remember that the sacrificial system was before Moses. Uh, when Cain and Abel, uh, apparently God showed them they need to do a sacrifice. And, and apparently God showed them the right sacrifice because Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable. Right, mm. because it did not involve a the shedding of blood. Shedding of blood. Okay, so to, to support my uh, conclusion, I use another complex Chinese word, which is the word for sacrifice. Now, uh, I'm talking about the classical form, not the simplified form. The simplified form has removed some very important elements, but the classical form has a bow or a calf. As a radical, a radical is a is a Chinese uh, like a qualifier. It's a qualifier. It's a classifier. Uh, as an iconic language to help the people understand what this word means, it gives clues. So um, there are words that relate to God. So you have the God uh, classifier or radical. If it relates to water, you see the tree dot, you know, the river, the, the uh, lake, uh, the, the sea. So you look at that and say, ah, oh, this word has to do uh, with certain things. You may not be able to pronounce it, but you'll be able to get some clues. So the classifier for uh, sacrifice has the bow, radical. And but, the animal. And the a animal, bull. the sacrificial animal, but it has righteousness, e. Lamb above me by his side. So immediately, nobody can argue that sacrifice and righteousness are linked together in the ancient Chinese mind. Because it's obvious. It's, it's, there. it's there. It's linked there. You cannot argue and say, oh, you are making it up. No. You, you see righteousness and you see sacrifice, they are linked. But more powerful than that, there is a variant form for the classical way of writing uh, sacrifice. Uh, the, the bottom half, me, wo, is written differently. It's written with seal to the left side. Seal, it's perfect, beautiful. So the ancient Chinese understood that the sacrifice that will bring about righteousness has to be a perfect sacrifice. Perfect sacrifice. Not just any sacrifice. Now, I get other support because in the Book of Rites, it describes the kind of sacrifice that is acceptable. It's called te shen, te as in special, shen as in animal, referring to the sacrifice. The, the, the border sacrifice is called jiao te shen. So te, which is now commonly used for special, originally refers to this perfect sacrifice. Oh, wow. There are some pictographs that have trees and the symbol for a mouth, mm -hmm. a mouth representing a person. Could you tell us about a couple of those? Yeah, so, so remember what I talked about, San Sin Tui tree, okay? So what I'm going to share is not just some conjecture on my part, all right? So you have the word for restraint, Yue Su. Restraint. Restraint. Now, if you and I were to design a word for restraint, we'd probably tie two hands together, oh, right? Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, the ancient Chinese superimposed the word mouth over the tree. So, so for some reason, the ancient Chinese understood that there is something to do with the tree and eating of it. Why? I believe it's because the, their ancestor told them the first restriction that God placed on them or the first restriction that humans experienced was do not eat from that tree. Right. Okay. Now, re what's related to the tree? You have two trees. And the Chinese classifier for God, si, xian si de si, at the bottom. So two trees with God means forbid. God forbade Adam and Eve to eat from wow. one of the two trees. Right? Wow. There are two trees in the Genesis. And that's the pictograph for forbid. That's right. Oh my. But there's another word that is almost similar. It is the two trees now with the woman at the bottom. And that immediately turns the word to mean covered. That means to desire oh. what is not appropriate. Oh. 
So two trees with a woman means is coveting. to covet, and the Ten Commandments say thou shall not covet. Yes. And covet means to want something that is not yours. That's right. Or, or uh, you should not have. Right. And so God said you can have anything in the garden, but not this tree yeah. of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. But the woman coveted it. Yeah. She wanted it. But you see, the interesting thing is, why the woman? Why not the man? Of course, you know, if you're a feminist, you say, we get this all the time, we yeah. get blamed for everything. Yeah, right. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, consistent with the Genesis record that the woman oh, yeah, right. was the one who took the first step, yes. right? Now, and, and I, I, will say here, I will say here for the sake of those who champion women causes, Adam was there. Okay, Adam was there when his wife was being tempted. He kept quiet. So Adam was at fault too. So I'm not blaming well, the woman Adam for it. Well, Adam joined in the sin. Well, he was there. And then the way God made us biologically, it seems that God said that the sin passed from Adam to the whole world. That's true. Yeah. Whereas um, the woman, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she conceived in her womb Jesus, but Jesus did not inherit sin yes. from his human mother. Yep. So we men pass down the sin to our children. Yeah. Very devastating. Yeah. Well, and, and because of that, uh, death came into the world, as the Genesis record says, and the Chinese word for death, shang, has the tree and two mouths. So these are all Chinese words with the tree related to the Genesis record. And once again, I'm saying, no, I did not dream up of this because here I have the San Sin Tui, uh, artifacts to, to support that they have some knowledge. And then this human and God interaction is very clearly spelled out in Chinese historical records. Wow. So your book, is there a, a track record of uh, people in China reading this and accepting Jesus as their savior? Do you know? Yes. <laughs> Multitudes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, for once, many Chinese say believing in Jesus is not anti-Chinese. In, in fact, this is the reason why I wrote this book. I, I came from a traditional Chinese family in Singapore. Uh, we are many ge generations of idol worshippers. I have a tribe. I tell people I don't have a family. I have four brothers and five sisters. I have uh, 50 first cousins. So when I became a Christian when I was 19 years old, uh, I was somewhat rejected by my family, but I accepted that as a sacrifice, you know, to, to have this relationship with God. It was worth it, and, but I thought it, it is something that I had to give up. But in my heart, there was this pain that I carried for many years that I am less a Chinese now than I'm a Christian. Oh. It is a, in fact, there's a Chinese saying, one more Christian, one less Chinese. Oh, my. Um, I accepted that for many years, but my wife and I moved to work in Beijing in 1995. In Beijing? Yes, and in Beijing, and uh, if you are a tourist to Beijing, there are three places that you will always go to, the Great War of China, the Forbidden City, and the Temple of Heaven. So I, on my own, would not like to go to the Temple of Heaven because I grew up visiting ugly, dirty, filthy tempers. I hated Chinese tempers. But because my friends would say they want to go to the temple of heaven, I would go with them reluctantly. But what I discovered there changed my life because then I, I, I realized, first of all, uh, this is not the temple by the Chinese standard. The Chinese word for temple is miao, and it comes from the Chinese word mao, mian mao, image. So the Chinese record explained that a temple is called miao because it is where you put an image of the deity. But the temple of heaven in Chinese is not tian miao. It's actually tian tan. It's an altar. So I started to notice that there are no images of God in the temple of heaven, or, or rightfully we should call altar of heaven. And then as I examine it, I discovered the procedures, the steps of the sacrifice is very similar to the Hebrew sacrificial system. 
uh, and then I discovered the prayers that are all there for us to examine. Um, and then one thing led to other. So it's a, it's a journey of discovery. So now I am very happy that I'm a, I'm a Chinese as well as an, uh, a Christian. So many of my Chinese friends are likewise finding this, that they don't have to give up their Chinese roots to become a Christian. So my book is actually a very liberating uh, reading for them. Yes, so uh, you mentioned Cain and Abel and God taught them about sacrifice through undoubtedly their father, Adam. And then after the global flood, Maybe Noah, even God, because God spoke to Cain oh, directly, yeah. remember? Yes. And then after the global flood, Noah built an altar and mm -hmm. offered a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I love that you pointed out that they could have had 11 generations. So the way the Chinese culture uh, elevates history, it's so important. And certainly... To those who came before Abraham, from the time of Noah to Abraham, that history would have been alive to them because their great, 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 great grandfather was still there talking about what happened. And so they learned sacrifice. So at the Tower of Babel then, when people traveled to the east, uh, they brought that knowledge with them. Mm -hmm. And they recorded it in the Chinese monument of their ancient pictographs. And you have helped the world. I think others also, but you have helped document this in your book. So I want to thank you uh, from Real Science Radio in Denver and Dr. Vern Bissell, who organized these talks. So thank you so very much, thank you, Dr. Bob. Tom. Thank you.